everyone and welcome to my Miss Strategy show. This is the first time I ever launched this series the, about strategy, about middle games, and also the first time I stream from home. So I hope it's going to work out. Cross fingers. Let me just check in the chat if you're all here. Hi to everyone. Okay, I think it's on. Um, let me tell you about uh, what's this about, what we're going to see, how we're going to learn, what's the structure of uh, the whole lecture. So this show is about middle games that you can see from the title. And I thought we should learn more about strategy and middle games because you all know a lot about openings. But if you think about uh, games that you lost, I think most of the games we, we lose are not in the opening. Uh, I, now I can see that you are here all in the chat. Thank you. I'll try to read it at the same time, but it's not so easy to talk and look at the chat. I'm going to try. So my point is that there are so many opening series we have on Chess24. I'm sure you learned a lot from them. And I'm sure you know a lot of opening books as well. But strategy is not that easy to learn. So these shows are, will all be about strategy and about the middle game, because once we are out of the book, once the lines are over, we still have to make good moves. And it's not so easy to make the best moves when we don't know the position. Of course, we cannot memorize every middle game, but what we will see in these shows are patterns, ideas, plans, so that you will have an idea how to play each position. And the structure of these shows is that we're going to build them up on the pawn structure because pawns are the soul of the position. That's what Philidor said. And since uh, we can build everything on the pawn structure, first we will start with hanging pawns, isolated pawns, always focusing on the pawn structure because the pawn structure will define what the position should be like, how shall we play. Um, therefore... Um, hanging pawns is our first topic, I already told you. And there are certain rules. Because now that you are my pupils, I would like you to do certain things. So this is a list of the things you need to do for me if you want to be a good pupil. No, no, that's just a bad joke. It's my Christmas shopping list. Um, what I need you to do are only two things. First of all, I want you to take an active role in this learning process. I need you to think. I need you to use your brain. I need you to not just watch this series, to watch these shows, but I need you to, to think about a line, think about an idea, think about a move. We're going to stop during the games. We're going to stop at many points. And I want you to think about how would you play that position? Because if I just tell you the solution, if I just tell you the right plans, then you will not remember so much from it. You will not learn so much from it. So I want you to think. I want you to use this part of our body very well. And then we will think about the solution together. We will discuss how the position should be played. That's the first thing. Be an active member of our classroom. And no matter where you are watching me right now, the live stream or the, the video later, I still want you to think each and every time I'll tell you what's this position about, how to play, what would you play, what's the best idea. And then the second thing is to have fun. So as a pupil of mine, I'd like you to enjoy the show. I'm not here to torture you. I'd like to have a good time while we are studying. So let's get on to hanging pawns. Uh, what are hanging pawns? Do you know what hanging pawns are? Can anybody tell me a definition quickly in the chat? I'll see if there's any answer. And at the same time, I will help you a bit with showing you this position. Oh, where's my board? There we go. Hanging pawns. Let me see if anybody in the chat can define me this, what hanging pawns are. Very good. Two, two, pa two pawns by themselves side by side. That's good. Very, very good, Capanson. So, as you can see, and also, let's just read out from Chest 24's glossary what hanging pawns are, because... You definitely know that we have a section where you can 
see the definition of each term. So we go to read glossary on chest 24, and there you will see that the definition for hanging pawns is that two pawns of the same color side by side with no other pawns of the same color. And I can't see the rest because it's not on my screen. So two pawns of the same color side by side with no other pawns of the same color supporting them. Sometimes a dynamic strength, but other times a static weakness. And that's the point, and that's why I like hanging pawns a lot, because sometimes it's going to be a strength in the position, sometimes we will win our games because we have hanging pawns, and sometimes we will lose these pawns in an end game, and that will be a painful loss. So it can be an advantage and a disadvantage, depending on how we can play with and against the hanging pawns. So with this show and the next ones as well, we will see how to how to play in the structure, how, how to play <laughs> with this structure and against it, how to place our pieces, what are the basic ideas and plans. And for that, we will also see a few more positions because here you already saw that these are hanging pawns. Normally there are more pieces on the board like in this case. And that means that here are our hanging pawns, these two pawns. We are always talking about central pawns, so let's not focus on pawns like, like these pawns. We are talking about two pawns that are in the center, side by side, no other pawns supporting them. And uh, it's important that they are in the center because the center is the most important part of the board and that's what will define the rest of the position. So. This is the skeleton of our position, hanging pawns for white. It can also be for black, but in general, this is a position where white has a hanging pawn, hanging pawns, and black will play against the hanging pawns. What can you see when you look at this position? What does white have besides having these pawns? Let me see if somebody can answer the char characteristics of this position. I don't need any moves. I would like you to think what are the advantages of having these pawns in this position. Yes, we've got semi-open files, the E file and the B file, very good. And more space, also very good. Yeah, don't tell me moves yet, please. Uh, just the, that we have the B file and the E file, semi-open files. We've got more space. We've got a very nice uh, square for our knight on e5. You already mentioned that too. Uh, strong bishops, yes, because our pieces are more active in general. If you have more space, you have more space for your pieces, you can have more active pieces. That is, we've got more space and more activity. Also, we've, we've got a better control in the center. Thanks to these pawns, you can see that how these pawns are controlling a lot of central squares going to try to color them. Many, many squares. Okay. What about black? What do you think what black should play for? If, uh, if it's so nice that white has more space, more activity, does it mean that uh, the player with hanging pawns will always win? I'll wait for your answer. I don't see any answers yet, but let's just sum up in the meantime that white has more space, more activity. Uh, very good, Rigoletto. For black, the end games are very favorable. It's very likely that these pawns, the hanging pawns, will be a weakness in an end game. So black should try to trade off pieces. The more pieces he exchanges, the better. Because these pawns are not supported by other pawns. That's the definition of hanging pawns. So they can be very weak in endgames. And also very good by Karo Khan that black should try to force white push these pawns to fix the structure because right now these pawns, the d4 pawn and the c4 pawn, are flexible. It's a mobile center. You can move c5, you can push d5 in the right moment. But if black manages to fix the structure by playing either b5 or e5 in the right moment, 
and force white to either break these pawns apart or have to push c5 and give up the d5 square. That means that um, these pawns will lose their flexibility and then they will be even weaker because you cannot push them anymore and you will have to keep on defending them with your pieces. So I think um, I'm very proud of my classroom. You all said many good things. White has more space, more activity. White should attack and white should look for a breakthrough with d5. And black, on the other hand, should try to trade off pieces and aim for an end game. Also try to fix these pawns either by playing b5 or e5, break the, those pawns apart. So, uh, we cannot look at all these ideas in one session because that's a lot. Uh, we will start with the breakthrough with d5. So that's our today's topic. And uh, just to add to what we've already mentioned, hanging pawns, you already know, uh, it's very similar to the isolated pawn positions, the ideas and the plans, because when you have an isolated pawn here, the isolated d4 pawn, sometimes black or white depending on who has the white isolated pawn will trade the knight on c3 and then we end up in a hanging pawns position so isolated pawn positions and hanging pawn positions are very similar to each other they share a lot of ideas in common let's begin with our first game which is uh, kasparov kremnik from 1992 and you will see that all the games we check will be from different openings because the point of these sessions is also that we are not learning any opening. You already know a lot of openings. We are learning about the middle game and hanging pawns can be reached from many different openings. So this game began with e4, c5, knight f3, knight c6, bishop b5, the Rosolimo variation of the Sicilian and after some moves we are not going to discuss the opening because what we want is to reach the middle game position with the hanging pawns so we're gonna just play through these moves c4 queen h5 bishop takes king takes and now after b takes c5 queen takes c5 d4 we raised the hanging pawns we raised our position those are the pawns we will talk about, and not only the pawns, but the whole position. So, of course, after d4, the queen has to go. And now, what to do? We should develop our pieces because they are not yet developed. Not all of them are developed. And I think the next move is very easy to guess. Knight c3, so I will not ask you about this, but I will ask about the next move. Because after rook d8, our pawn is hanging. So, this is the first moment when we are faced with this ugly truth that our pawn can be hanging many times. If we are playing with the hanging pawns uh, and they are not supported by other pawns, by definition they are not supported by other pawns, then you should really do something about these ugly attacks. Like right now, three pieces are attacking the d4 pawn and we should react. So what would you play now with white? I hear some of you saying d5, but let's calculate it. d5 is a very possible move and a very good move because you take advantage of uh, some tactical motives, but careful because our queen is also on the d5. So it might work or it might not. Let's calculate it. What happens after d5, e takes d5? What's your plan with white? If it works, then it's really good, but let's see if it works. Yeah, very good, Oscar Shells. Uh, D5 is not good in this position. It's very tempting. It looked like a really good move, and uh, that's our topic, the breakthrough with D5. But it wasn't the moment yet, because the B5 bishop will be hanging. So we cannot exchange, we cannot go for this variation with c takes d5 because after knight takes d5 our knight on c3 is overloaded it has to defend the b5 bishop so we have lost a pawn that's why 
D5 is not a good move yet. That was a tricky question, I think, that here, what to play with white? How can we defend this pawn, or how can we avoid that this pawn is taken? I see some of you saying c5, and others suggest knight e2. Yeah, they are all candidates. Let's go for knight e2 first, which defends the pawn, but the problem is that we protected the pawn, but after knight f5, this pawn is hanging again, and we have to do something about it again. That means that with knight e2, we didn't really achieve anything, because... Once again, we would need to protect the pawn, and we will have to capture this knight now. And, well, the knight on e2 is not really good, and now our, our pawn on c4 is hanging. These pawns will always be hanging. So, knight e2 is not the best here. c5 is an okay option, because after c5, queen a5, for instance, rook c1, we protect the knight, um, bishop d7. Um, the only thing is that I don't like c5 because we are playing on the edge of what black wants. Black wants us to fix this pawn structure in the center and after c5 it's very difficult to push d5. So we lost the flexibility of these pawns. And for instance here bishop takes c6 would be a really bad move already because bishop takes c6. Now this is a dream position for black playing against the hanging pawns, we cannot advance our pawns. The d4 pawn will always be hanging. He's got a really nice square on d5 for his knight. And also the rooks will be doubled on the d5 attacking our pawn. So this would be a really good position for black. Of course, we don't have to capture on c6. Uh, I'm just saying that after c5, white should be careful in order not to um, not to get a, a position where he is worse already. Here, white is still okay. but it's not that easy anymore how to continue. Maybe queen e2, and then it's a different story. Because after rook d8, there's a move that I haven't heard yet. I think you should consider yet another move. It's a bit uh, strange or surprising that this move can be the best, but it is the best. So we can defend this pawn by... Let me see if somebody has said it. Let's try. So you already said c5, you said d5, you said knight e2, and there's one move I haven't heard yet, and it's the move that Kasparov played. So let's try to guess it. Rook e4 is also possible defending the pawn, but remember that when you have the hanging pawns, when you are playing with the hanging pawns, you want to attack. You want to take the initiative. You want to be active. So we don't want to play moves like knight e2 or rook e4 if it's just for the sake of defending the pawn. We want to push d5. So if we cannot play d5 right now, how can we make it possible? What's the problem with d5 now? You're, remember that we check this line, d5, e takes, c takes, and knight takes d5 because the b5 bishop is hanging. So how can we play d5? What was wrong with d5 immediately? And very good, finally. Thank you, guys. Bishop takes c6. This is a move that you would normally think that it's not a good move because, well, at least for me, I like bishops a lot. And uh, there's another knight on e7, so normally we wouldn't think that bishop takes c6 is a big deal because black can capture with the knight. But, as you can see already with the diagonal and this colored nice d5 square, the knight has left from e7 and that knight on e7 was protecting the d5 square. So that means that after bishop takes c6, knight takes c6, what we achieved is that we can finally, we can finally play d5. 
Very good. And that's indeed what would have happened in the game if Kramnik played knight takes c6. Here d5 and white's position is just really, really good. Let's go back to the moment where we take on c6 because bishop takes c6 can be met with either queen takes c6, knight takes or b takes. And we're going to go through all of them because you have to pay attention to, for instance, what happens if b takes c6? Then we will most likely not play d5 ever because now there are two pawns protecting the square. So you could think that after b takes c6, black is fine because he prevented our plan with d5. That's true. We cannot play d5 anymore. But the structure has changed and now our plan will change as well. After b takes c6, rook b1 is a very natural move. We develop and attack at the same time. We place the rook on the open file. And when the queen goes back, what's the threat of black? I want you to think, what is black threatening in this position? Or what could he play if it was his turn? I hear by chess player 007, hi, James Bond, that the bishop on c8 is going to be a disaster and it's true. So let's play against that bishop. Black is threatening c5, very good Alexander. And many of you have said it right after that, that he is threatening to push c5. So what shall we do against c5? Yes, the e5 square is going to be a great outpost for our knight, and the other knight can jump to e4. So, by playing knight e4, we prevent the push c5, and the other knight is preventing the push e5. And later, we're going to place our knights on e5, on c5, or what can also happen is that after, for instance, knight f5, we place c5 ourselves, because... Even though we fixed the, uh, the pawn structure, now we don't care about that anymore. We don't want to play d5 anymore. What we want is to play against this very bad c8 knight. c8 knight. c8 bishop. Black's bishop is horrible. It cannot move because the pawn structure... Uh, look at that pawn structure. There's a pawn on e6, another pawn on c6. Black can only try to find a diagonal for that bishop by playing bishop a6. And trying to get with the bishop to some more active square. But will we let him play bishop c4 and bishop d5? Will we let him activate this bishop? I think he wouldn't. So how to prevent bishop c4? I agree with you, Floris, that the, the d4 pawn looks really weak after c5, and also the d5 square, but these are the disadvantages of c5, of us playing c5, but it has advantages as well. And that is that now we will play knight e5, very good guys. Knight e5 or, well, sometimes you should calculate first, like, knight e5 is the plan. So the problem is that if we play knight e5, our pawn is still hanging. That's why we have to chase the knight away first. I forgot about that. And uh, I think some of you also. Let's not forget about the pawn. g4, it looks like we weakened the king. But after knight e5, we have such strong knights on e5, on e4. And uh, we are threatening to play, for instance, knight e6. And those knights are just horribly strong. And there's no way for black to attack the king on g1, even though we had to play g4 to chase the knight away from f5. You cannot attack that king on g1 because white pieces are much more active. And the bishop on a6 will not be able to find any good square. He cannot play bishop c4. And he cannot go to any other diagonal with that bishop. So this position is just very good for white. Let's see what would have happened I'll, I'll give you a moment to think about this. Uh, yep. G4. Okay, yeah. I think everybody understood that we had to play G4 first. I forgot about that. 
So let's go back to the moment where we played bishop takes c6. We already talked about knight takes c6. If knight takes, then just d5. This is what we wanted. We wanted to break through with d5. What about queen takes c6? That was what Kramnik played in the game. After queen takes c6, how shall we continue? Our pawn is hanging on c4. We have to do something about that. So how to defend that pawn? Yes, we can either go knight e5 or, yes, knight e5 is, is a good move, but uh, as Joe Breaker pointed out, queen e2 is also a very good option because if you remember, in all those lines with the, the d5 push, our problem was that the queen is on d1. So we want to move the queen away from the d5 and then push d5. That's why right now, queen e2 is a really good move. Queen b3 is also an option, but if you place the queen on e2 and with this rook on e1, it means that we are really threatening d5 because the knight on e7 will be hanging. So if it was wise turn, we can simply play, play d5 and this pawn cannot be captured. What about moving that knight away from e7? Can it avoid d5? For instance, Oh, what am I doing? Knight f5. Can this move avoid our plan? Can it avoid d5? It's threatening to capture our pawn on d4, but that doesn't matter because we will play d5 and we can play d5 because after e takes, knight takes. Now, this pawn on c4 has become an isolated pawn, it's on its own, it cannot be protected, it's not a really good pawn, but it doesn't matter because it's supporting a very powerful knight. So this knight on d5 is a beast and we are threatening, for instance, queen e5 check or queen b2 check, attacking black's king because suddenly the position has opened up. And that's what we wanted because if you look at white's pieces, white has already developed, while black would still need to bring the bishop out, bring the rook from a8. So he lacks development. And when the opponent lacks development, you should definitely open up the position and attack as soon as possible because we should take advantage of our development advantage. That is here, for instance, if black wants to finish development, he should try to finish development. Bishop e6, we can play queen b2 check. And after king g8, I want you to find a very strong move. How to continue our attack here with white? Yes, knight f6 is possible, g4 as well. Uh, what's the point behind g4? You want to chase the knight away for a reason. Can we attack that knight without weakening our king? Very good, Schindler. Knight d4. We can play knight f6 later as well. Knight f6 is a very tempting check, but knight d4 in this position. Look at that. Knight d4. And black cannot capture this knight because of this beautiful knight fork. So he has to move the queen, after which this check is already much more painful. We capture now on e6. And it's not only that we have one upon with queen takes b7, but we are starting mating one on h7 and our attack still goes on. So this position is lost for black. And it's all because we played, we managed to play d5 in the right moment when black still did not finish his development. We broke through with d5, placed our knight on d5, 
And suddenly black's king was just horribly weak on the dark squares. Look at that king on g7. It's like a fianchetto position where he would need a bishop on g7. But there's no dark square bishop. So the dark squares in this position are horribly weak. And that's why he almost got mated. That's why he would lose this position almost immediately. Yeah, I agree with you, chess player 007, that this is a disaster position for black. So instead of knight f5, he should try something else, something different. Kramnik played a6, but uh, that doesn't help either because uh, we can still take the initiative. We can either play, let me hear it from you. What can we play here with white? Very good, Captain. D5 is still possible, so we can either play D5 here, um, which is a very good move, d5. Or we can make one more move that prepares d5 and develop the last piece that haven't, hasn't been activated yet, which is d, the a1 rook. So let's play rook ac1. d5 was good. And also rook ac1. Rook ac1 was the move that Kasparov played because, of course, as you know, Kasparov always activated all his pieces, always developing all his pieces, and then going for the opponent. So right now, white has developed all his pieces, and black still needs a couple of moves to finish his development. Therefore, d5 is going to be our next move that's very likely. He cannot prevent it. That's the problem. So that's why Kasparov didn't play d5 immediately, because black cannot prevent d5. He played queen c7, but we will still play d5. I'm sure you all said it, because that's what we were planning. d5. Actually, we placed the rook on the c5. I see that you are saying rook a d1 was also a good move, but he wanted to place the rook on the c5 because the opponent's king is king. The opponent's queen is on the c5. So when we exchange pawns on d5, then the queen will be hanging or be under a discovered attack on the c file. So that's why right now it was better to place the rook on the c file. Also, it's protecting the c3 knight, so we can capture on d5 with the pawn if we need to in the future. But right now, after d5, black cannot even capture on d5 because that's why queen e2 was such a good move. No matter that he played queen c7, defending the e7 knight, we are attacking it with two pieces. So e takes d5 is not possible. What about bishop d7? What if he tries to finish development? We achieved our goal. We wanted to break through with d5. But it's not only that you need to find the right moment to play d5 and prepare it, but you also need to know what happens then. We managed to play d5, and what? What's next? How to progress in this position? And that's a question to you. So I'm going to wait for some of the answers. And I've seen the good move by... No, no, he wants to play knight e4, and that's very good. Also, Jan and the G, ing, ing, uh, so many of you have said it. Thank you, guys. Very good job. Knight e4, and we will threaten so many things. So let's just check. That's what Kasparov played. Uh, no, sorry. He, that's what he would have played, because Kramnik didn't play bishop d7. We are just analyzing this position after bishop d7. Knight e4 would have been a very strong move, we are threatening d6 fork, we are threatening queen b2 check and knight f6. And I think that's all, but that's a lot because black cannot prevent everything. 
So this position is once again just lost for black after knight e4. After d5, what Kramnik played was f6. He wants to protect the dark squares, but this just gives up a pawn. So let's grab it. If, if your opponent offers a pawn, take it, unless it's a trap. So first we calculate, then we take the pawn. D takes e6. And, well, we'll see the rest of the game. It just finished very shortly after rook d6, knight d5, queen d8, knight takes f6, because in case of king takes f6, it's mate with queen e5, rook takes knight e4, knight c6, and this check. Once again, it's not only a pawn up for white, but uh, black's king is still very weak, and black still hasn't managed to finish his development. All his pieces, well, not all his pieces, but most of his pieces are on the 8th rank, and that's a disaster. So here, after check, n9, g5, f4, and rook d1, Kramnik decided to resign because all the white pieces are active, they are all attacking, while black has hardly any defending pieces and he hardly has any good pieces. So the important thing from this game was this moment. Our pawn was hanging on d4. And uh, this was the moment when passive defense, like knight e2, was not a good option. When you play with the hanging pawns, when you have hanging pawns, you should be as active as possible. You should try to attack, you should try to find dynamic play in the position. So here, bishop takes c6 was a very good move. That bishop was hanging in many lines, so we give up that bishop in order to have the possibility to play d5. After queen takes c6, queen e2, we come out of this d5 with the queen, so now we are threatening d5 because then e7 knight will be hanging. And even if he plays knight f5, this is a line we checked, then d5 and our knight will be very strong on d5. So this is what we should learn from this Kasparov game. I really like this game. And now we're going to see another one. You remember what was the opening in this game? Can anybody tell me what was the opening in this game? This show is not about the opening, but I just try to... I'm just testing you if you remember what opening was this game, the Kasparov Kremlin game. Now let's see if somebody can tell me it was the Sicilian. Very good. Sicilian, uh, the Russian Rimmel variation of the Sicilian. So our next game is going to be once again about the hanging pawns once again about the breakthrough with d5 and it's going to be a completely different opening. Aronian Stavich from 2011 and the game begins with c4. So it's a bit difficult to believe that we will reach a similar middle game but we will. Let's go through the first few moves. Isolated pawn. You remember that they are like brothers, the isolated pawn and hanging pawns. So this is an isolated pawn position. We will study that also later on. But now, bishop c4, this is an intermediate move. I will not discuss the opening, but black cannot keep the knight. He cannot keep the piece up. And after b takes c3, hanging pawns. Okay, they are not hanging yet. But when you see a pawn on c3 and on d4, it's already the type of position we are discussing because white will push c4 sooner or later, so we will reach the position that we wanted. Bishop g7, what would you play here with white? This bishop has been developed to g7, and we can either castle kingside or
Bishop a3, very good, guys, very good. So, always pay attention to these moments in your games. The mechanic move would be castle king side, that's the most natural move on the board, but bishop a3 is definitely the most annoying one. We develop our bishop to a3, and we don't let black castle. That's so simple, but it's a... Uh, this is something that uh, I learned that when I play very quickly, I would definitely play castle king side or such, the most natural move. But uh, these are the moments when we can miss our chance. I'm not saying that bishop a3 is winning. There are still games with this position. It's not a novelty. It's nothing new. But I'm sure that this is the most annoying move in this position because... We simply don't let our opponent play the, in the most comfortable way. We don't let him castle. So black has to play bishop f8. And, well, he will not manage to castle. He will play with king g7, of course. That's almost like castling. But look at his pawn structure and tell me where are the weaknesses in black's camp. Which squares are weak? In the meantime, I'm going to have my tea. Very good, Rishig. The dark squares. Yeah, so many of you have said it. The dark squares. So, does it make sense to exchange the dark square bishops when the opponent's position is full of weak, weak dark squares? Of course, because without the dark square bishop, his position will be even worse. If your opponent has weaknesses on the dark squares, exchange the bishop that protects those squares. And that's what happened in this game. So now we're going to castle, of course, king g7. And right now, black is threatening to play knight a5 just to capture a bishop. What to do against this threat? It's not like the biggest threat in the world, but still, we don't want to let him play knight a5 because we know that the player who is playing against the hanging pawns wants to trade off pieces. So we want to keep as many pieces as possible. We want our pieces to be active. What to do against knight a5? I'm not seeing any answers yet. That you think a bit more. Would you move the queen? Would you move the bishop? What to do against knight a5? Let's not play queen b4. I'm sure you meant another move, Rishik. What did you mean? You meant queen b5? We can go queen c2, but the more active, the better. So... Bishop d3 is also possible because we will want to push c4 later. Queen b5, that's the best move because it not only prevents knight a5, but it also prevents the most natural developing move for black. Because if we play any other queen move or bishop d3 or bishop e2, we let black play b6. And that's what he wants. He wants to play b6, and then he would go bishop b7. And this is just a very normal position for black. So, whenever we have the chance, let's just not only think about preventing the opponent's threats, but also making developments the most difficult for him. After queen b5, he cannot play b6. And he cannot play bishop d7 because then the b7 pawn is hanging. So queen b5 prevented knight a5 and it also prevents a lot of other things. It prevents black from developing his bishop right now. He has to lose some time on protecting this pawn. He has to play queen c7. But now we will play bishop e2 
and then prepare c4 and hopefully d5 as well. Rook d8 was played in the game, so we cannot play c4 because our pawn would be hanging, but doesn't matter, we will protect it first and then push c4. It's very normal that with the hanging pawns you place your rooks in this way, one rook on the d file and the other on the c file, especially if the opponent's queen is on the c file. So this is a very natural setup with the hanging pawns. Now black could play b6, of course we couldn't prevent it forever, but queen b5 was still a very good move, black lost some time preparing b6. And after c4, here they go, hanging pawns, knight e7 in order to avoid d5. What shall we do with white? We would love to play d5, but we can't play it right now. I mean, we could, but it's not the moment to play it, because we placed our queen on b5 in order to avoid b6. But right now our queen is not doing on b5 anymore. So it had a very nice objective, queen b5, preventing b6, but the position has changed and our queen is not the best on b5 anymore. Where to place this queen? Where could it be better? then on b5. Yes, rook a c1 is a good move, but before playing that move, we want to threaten d5 by playing queen b2. Very good, Rishik. So first it was queen b5 to prevent b6, and now that... Uh, the queen is not doing much on b5 anymore. We come back with the queen to threaten d5 check. And that's, that's a very annoying threat. So the dark squares. You remember we exchanged the dark square bishops and the dark squares are weak. It seemed that we didn't do anything against black's king, but now the action will start. We want to attack black's king. And from b5, it wasn't possible. We could have played queen g5 as well, but you will see that the most important place for the queen in this position is this diagonal because we will play d5 at some point and then everything will open up and black's king will be in trouble. So black has to move the king away from the diagonal by playing king g8. And now what shall we do? There are two tempting moves in this position and one is more accurate than the other. I see some moves like knight g5 and h4. I'm not sure they are the best because knight e5, yeah, that's the square where our knight is heading. We could play knight g5, but the knight in itself is not going to mate black's king. So a much better square for the knight is the central square, knight e5. The other tempting option in this position and a very natural move would have been rook a c1. But I want you to see the difference between these two moves. They are both good, rook a c1 and knight e5. But in case of rook a c1, black can simply finish development by playing bishop b7. And if we play knight e5 here, because we want to have this strong knight in the center, then he will play knight c6. Black wants to exchange pieces, and that is what he's doing. He wants to exchange our beautiful knight on e5. So rook c1 is not the best move. It's an okay move, but not the most accurate, because it lets black finish his development, and it lets him exchange our knight on e5, or at least threaten the knight on e5. But if we play knight e5 immediately, then bishop b7 is not possible. And you will tell me why. What happens if after knight e5, black responds with bishop b7?
94 is possible, but in order to make 94 a very strong move, strong, <laughs> I tried to pronounce it strong. <laughs> in order to make 94 a very strong move, you should play d5 first. Very good, very good captain and chess player, and Rishik, and all of you who said d5. D5, we give up the pawn because you can see that so many of black pieces are protecting that square and still we play D5. We sacrifice the pawn because after E takes D5, we will not even bother capturing that pawn. We lost it anyway, so why to capture? We wanted to play D5 in order to open the diagonal for the queen and now we play knight G4, so we connected this idea Queen on b2, knight on g4, we open the diagonal with d5, and now we are threatening things like knight h6 check, queen a8, mating, very very soon, and uh, the problem is that black cannot close this diagonal. He can play d4, but that's only temporary, because we will capture this pawn, and once again we are threatening knight h6, he cannot play f6, he cannot exchange the queens, so... This is a position where he should try something like knight f5, but after queen b2, now we are threatening the other knight check, we are threatening knight f6. So if he plays like knight g7, trying to hide the king somewhere there behind the knight, we can just go rook d1. And for instance, in the case of rook d8, we have knight f6 check, and in case of king h8, I want you to find the solution once again, because in this position, white has a beautiful move. It seems like black has managed to exchange most of the pieces, but still, the position is so dangerous with the queen on b2, the knight on f6, and all those dark squares weak, the whole long diagonal very weak, so how can we win this game? What's the best way to play here? Let me see if somebody has said it already. Let's finish the game off. How to win this position? Yes, chess player is right that uh, normally a bishop would be on g7 protecting the king, so that's why when we play the fianchetto we want to have that bishop and not exchange it. Rook d7, very good guys, very, very Beautiful. I love this move. If rook takes d7, then knight e8, the queen is hanging and we are threatening queen takes g7, mate. Let me just put back the position. Rook d7, everything is hanging on the 7th rank and the, queen, the rook cannot be captured because of knight e8. This would have been a beautiful finish. So after knight e5, we are threatening d5, sacrificing this pawn, and then playing knight g4 to attack black's king. That's why Stavich played h5, protecting the g4 square, but, but this means that he used yet another tempo for protecting his king, for avoiding threats, and not developing his pieces. He is still with the bishop on c8, with the rook on a8. So... Now, after knight e5, we will certainly bring the rook as well. That's the last piece to develop. Many of you have said it already that we should play rook c1. All the white pieces are very well placed. All the white pieces are active. And when black plays bishop b7, it's your turn once again to think. I see that chess player says bishop takes h5. Uh, you can consider it, but just uh, pay attention to our main goal is to open the position. And once we manage to open the position with d5, very good guys. Got Mock Brownie, you've all said d5. And Rishik, once again, d5, d5, you all said d5. You are very good pupils. Thank you guys for being here. First of all, we play d5, and then we see if the sacrifices work. So let's not sacrifice our pieces first. Let's play d5. We sacrifice a pawn, not a piece. That's better than playing bishop takes h5. We need to open the diagonal. 
because the queen is the most powerful piece and we want to have the diagonal for the queen in order to attack black's king. d5, and after e takes, c takes, you see how useful the rook is on c1. So one rook on the d file and the other rook on the c file. And after this exchange, black's queen is hanging. He has to play queen d6. And it seems that we're going to lose the pawn because black is attacking it with four pieces. But we can play. What can we play? Yeah, I understand. Just play. You want to play bishop takes h5 later. Yeah, you're right that in some position it might work. So let's not forget it. Yes, total domination for white. But what shall we do about that pawn? Because black wants to capture it so badly. We can play knight c6 or knight c4. What's the idea behind knight c4? When we play knight c4, we attack first of all the queen. That's very obvious, but the point is that we prepare d6. And this is what I wanted you to learn from this game. We are not done yet, but I want you to see that once we manage to break through with d5, it's either because we will open the position, we will have a very strong attack, or we will have a very strong passed pawn in the end game. Because when we have the hanging pawns, it doesn't mean that we will always lose the end game. It might be the case when our pawns are weak. But if we manage to break through with d5 and create this horribly strong passed pawn on d6, then all the end games are good for us. And you will see that now, suddenly, it's gonna be white who wants to exchange queens and not black. After knight f5, d7, look at that pawn. It's already on the seventh rank, almost about to be promoted. So black tried to create some attack against white king. With this bishop on b7, it's very normal that our g2 pawn will be attacked. But after queen g5, we can play g3. It weakens the white squares, but everything is under control because after h4, Tell me, how can we exchange queens? There must be, must be a way to try to exchange queens because now all we want is to exchange queens and win the endgame. So if we manage to exchange queens, black will have to resign, basically. His only threat is that he's gonna create some kind of a counterattack like... I will not tell you. What's his threat? After h4, what does black want? Yeah, we can offer to exchange queens with queen d2, that's very good. What is the threat after h4? Because I want you to tell me that as well. Queen d2 is the way to exchange queens, very good. And we have to do that, or another move that Aronian played, because black wants to capture this pawn on g3. And not only with the pawn, he wants to sacrifice his knight there, so he's threatening h takes, knight takes, and then mating us. So you have to be careful always that the opponent will have counterplay too. We cannot just play always one-sided, we have a passed pawn and we will win. No, we still have to play very precise. He's threatening to mate us, basically, or give at least perpetual check. So we have to play either queen d2, which is a good move, or, but Aronian played, this is already a much more difficult move to find g4. It's not very usual to place our pawn on g4, especially when the opponent's queen is on g5. But now he is really threatening queen d2 because in that case black will have to capture the queen his knight is hanging we cannot capture the knight right now because our pawn is pinned but once we play queen d2 he will have to exchange it and then move his knight unless he wants to lose a piece so what he did was knight g7 but now queen e5 is once again what we want we want to exchange queens because after knight e6 queen takes knight takes Ninety-five. This pawn is just too too strong. 
let's see how the game finished because well we will not see all of it but most of it king g7 rook c3 he's bringing the rook to the e-file and now after g5 actually Stavich resigned because his position is hopeless he's not lost immediately i mean the position is lost lost but uh, there's no immediate winning move in this position but What's very painful for black is that he cannot do anything. He will always have to keep his rooks on the 8th rank. He cannot. He cannot win the d pawn. That's the main problem, that he cannot attack this pawn with bishop c6. He cannot capture it. He cannot do anything about our passed pawn. And basically, in this position, this passed pawn is like a piece up because, first of all, it takes a lot of squares away from black. Secondly, and most importantly, we always threaten to promote it, so he has to keep an eye on this pawn. And third, blacks, uh, blacks, white other pieces, the rooks, the knight, and also the bishop, are very active, by black cannot do anything. So let me just show you what could have happened, for instance, just to demonstrate something like this could have happened in the game. If they continued knight c6, we will always play. And... Even though we cannot promote the pawn yet, this is an end game. We don't have to win immediately. We bring the king. This pawn will most likely fall. The h4 pawn will fall because you cannot always protect it. Knight d8. Then we would go back with the knight. And if, for instance, rook a7, f4, and then f5. This is just such a hopeless position for black. We are threatening to take even more space away from him. And if he captures them, either rook d6 or knight f5, this pawn will also fall. The, I mean, the pawn on h4 will be hanging, and we still have this horribly strong pawn on d7. We can always play rook e8 as well. This position is lost. And that's all because we had hanging pawns in the middle game. We managed to break through in the right moment. And then Aronian pushed his pawn till d7, to the d7 square about to be promoted and this pawn won the game all he needed to do was get into an end game so it doesn't when you have hanging pawns doesn't mean that you will never play the end game first we want to break through with d5 and once we have this d passed pawn then the end games are good all of them all of them are good just let's not lose the pawn our last game is another opening yet another opening but uh, let me just ask you a quick question again what was the opening in the Aronian game yeah I see that you're talking about Stavish that he's a grandmaster from Croatia sorry if I didn't mention of course Aronian is much better but uh, we are focusing on the plans so I basically don't choose the games depending on the names i choose the games because i like the ideas and the plans of course when you when you see players like kasparov and aronian that's sure that they play in an excellent way so that's a good pick and i like to choose their games but i want to show you the most instructive games and so that you can see that in which positions can we play d5 because we want to break through with d5 <laughs> Yes, it was the English and it transposed to the Karakan, it's transposed to this isolated pawn position and the Kasparov game was a Sicilian, the Rosalima variation, so so far we had a Sicilian, we had an English opening transposing to the Karakan and now we're gonna see a third opening because it doesn't matter what opening you play, you can just end up in hanging pawns position from so many different variations. Let's see this Lotier Rublevsky game. D4 d5 knight f3 e6 e3 so this is going to be a queen's gambit accepted position a queen's pawn position so we had e4 c4 and now d4 and they will all end up with this common feature that at the end in the middle game we will have hanging pawns let's see how Take takes hanging pawns. The difference is that here black has the pair of bishops, so that's a, a more favorable scene for black. But still, we have this e5 square for the knight, 
as in other lines as well. With the hanging poles, you have so many squares under control in the center that many times 95 is a possibility. And after bishop d7, rook fd1 was played, in many positions we saw already that the rook on the d5, the other rook on the c5, if black's queen is on c7, if the queen is on e7, you can also play rook a d1 and bringing the f rook to e1. So depending on where the black queen is, you want one of the rooks to face the queen and the other rook to support your d4 pawn. Rook f d8 and d5 was played. This position is still complicated. Here white is not winning just by playing d5. But what I want you to see is that after this exchange, knight takes d5. Important because right now we have almost opened the diagonal for the bishop. I mean, it's opened. The knight is on e5, but once the knight jumps away from the e5 square, we will threaten the pawn on g7. And uh, that's what I want to show you with this example that here we play d5, but it's not likely that we can make a strong pass pawn from it, at least not right now, because the d6 square is under control. But what happens after d5, after pushing d5, is that the diagonal opens up, the position opens up, and if there are no defending pieces around Black's King, or there are not enough defending pieces, which is the case here, that means that we will have a very strong attack against Black's King. So here, we will not win because of the d5 passed pawn, we will win because of the Black King. Let's attack the Black King. After rook e8, rook c1 was played, and here, after queen d8, queen d6 would have been a better move, but Rublowski played queen d8. After queen d8, I want you to find a way to attack black's king. What shall we play? How to do it? Very good arch chess. Queen h5. And Brownie and Rishik, suddenly all the moves appear. You know that there's a bit of lag between the stream and the chat, so that's why I'm waiting all the time to read your comments, to read the answers. Queen h5, that's the best move. Very good, guys. We are threatening to capture on f7, and we want to force black play g6. Because g6 is a move that black definitely didn't want to play, but he has to play. If he had played rook f8, then d6 here is really strong. Doesn't matter that we're not promoting the pawn, it takes a lot of squares away from, from black. So after bishop f6, knight takes d7, queen takes, and this pawn structure is just so horrible that black will be mate is shortly with rook g4 and rook h4 that's why after queen h5 black unfortunately had to play g6 which just weakens the dark squares around his king the squares that are under the attack of our beautiful bishop on b2 so very good move queen h5 forcing g6 and now we come back with the queen to f3 once again attacking this pawn but we achieve something, this g6 pawn uh, advance, and the pawns, as we all know, cannot go backwards, so it was very worth playing queen h5, forcing this weakening of the dark squares. And after bishop f5, I want you to think, what would you play, how to continue the attack? I'm waiting for your answers. We can go 
G4 or D6. D6 is actually the strongest move. Let's see why. Of course, this pawn, once again, is going to be so annoying on d6, taking away so many squares and forcing this bishop move. He cannot take the pawn because then after knight c4 and bishop a3, he will lose a piece. There's the spin on the d5, so he cannot capture the pawn. That's something that we had to calculate. Before you play d6, you should make sure that you're not just losing the pawn for nothing. And if bishop f6, what to play now? How to continue the attack? Yes, I agree that d6 is stronger, g4 was probably easier to see uh, but d6 was the best move in that position it's what Lottie should have played in that moment and now very good after bishop f6 we have d7 marching with this pawn all the way through and here uh, the point is that even if black takes two minor pieces for the rook which normally would be okay, but not here because we have queen takes b7. Not only for the sake of taking the pawn, what we want is, in case of rook b8, white has a very beautiful finish, which I want you to find. What can white play in this position? Rook c8. Very good, guys. Rook c8. Because now the pawn, well, it's going to be promoted no matter what. Rook takes c8. D takes c8. The queen will be exchanged. And then rook d8 check wins the bishop. So it's an exchange up. That was a very nice sequence. Let's see once again after rook b8 how strong this passed pawn is because it lets us play rook c8, after which white is winning. So if d7, instead of rook takes e5, that's what we have seen, rook f8, how would you continue here with white? So we have this position now, guys, let's see, after d7, rook f8, how to continue the attack, let's keep up with the initiative, we can take the pawn on b7, but be careful because there's this my bishop on b2 that might be hanging after rook b8 and also we just uh, don't want to grab that pawn just for the sake of capturing the pawn we took it in the previous position because we had this rook c8 move to promote our pawn so let's still focus on the king side on white's king and those bishops because after g4 that you said this is the best moment to play g4 because now no matter what uh, black plays, let's see, for instance, bishop e6. This move, once again, works. So if black takes it, d takes, and the bishop was hanging, that's a beautiful sequence that I hope that many of you have seen. No, actually, it was difficult to see, but when you see a piece that is so overloaded the queen has to protect the, the bishop on f8 and it has to protect the c8 square because of the rook c8 moves that's really when you need to feel that something is going on here 
And thanks to this very strong past pawn, rook c8 is possible once again. No matter how many pieces are protecting that square, if we can deflect the black queen from d8, we are simply winning a piece. So after g4, bishop e6, rook c8 wins the game. What about g4 and bishop takes e5? Because if black realizes that his bishop will be hanging on f6, it's very logical to take on e5 first. And then here he could play queen g5, for instance, threatening our pawn. And after h3, h5. It seems like black is attacking. What can we do here? What shall we do in this position, guys? Very good, bishop f4. Of course, we will not let him just capture on g4 and win a pawn. After bishop f4, the queen cannot go away because we will win a piece. So he has to play h takes g4, and this is the moment where we will simply capture his queen and promote our pawn. So once again, we will be an exchange up. Exchange? No, this is gonna be this is gonna be a rook up. What am I saying? So the point is that after d6, d7, and g4, we combined our kingside attack with uh, this post pawn on d7. So we will be we were threatening. The f7 pawn, we were threatening on the long diagonal. We have this beautiful knight on e5. And by combining our kingside attack with this powerful d pawn, in some variations we will win a piece, in some variations we gave mate almost, and in other lines we would promote the pawn. The point is that black has to defend against so many threats at the same time. That's the reason why his position collapsed. The only pity is that Lotia didn't play d6 in the game. He played queen b3 and he won in a different way. This wasn't the, the best move in the position, so I just wanted to show you this d6, d7 idea, and then g4. We have one more game to see, which is Yusupov's game, and begins with d4. Yeah, well, sorry, I couldn't choose all the games from a different opening, but it's a bit different. It's not the same, it's still e3, but he didn't play c4, so he it's not going to be uh, a queen's gambit accepted, but it is the Rubinstein variation of the queen's pawn game with b3. And here, look at that pawn structure in the center. Either black will capture the pawns, or either black will take on c4 and d4, or white, but in both cases, one of the players will end up having hanging pawns. So... Soon we will reach the position we want. Bishop a3, queen c1, he protected this. It's all opening theory. We will not discuss it. Hanging pawns. Rook d8. Our pawn is hanging. What shall we do about it? You remember that in another game we've already seen we want we had the same problem that this pawn was hanging on d4 in that case the good move in Kasparov's game the good move was bishop takes c6 while well, there's no bishop on b5 so we cannot play that in other positions we had the option of playing d5 but here is it a good move to play d5 no not yet so this is a third case when simply we will play Rook d1. And very good. Congratulations to all of you who said Rook a d1. Because we saw so many games with the idea Rook f d1, Rook a c1. But now Black's Queen is on e7. And that's when you will want to place this Rook here and the other Rook on the e file. 
So we will play rook a d1 and then the other rook will go to the e file. Good job, guys. Very good. b6 was played. And now, how shall we continue? I see you guys are arguing arguing about who said first the correct move. You are all winners to me because you all managed to guess the right move. But even those of you who didn't find the move when I asked for it in other positions either, don't worry. The, the thing is that you should think. But I already told you that I want you to participate actively, even if you are not writing your answers in the chat. Do it for yourself. Just think about the positions where we stop and once you deepen in the position, once you try to figure it out yourself, what's the idea, what's the plan, then you will really learn from it. So that's why we are stopping in so many places. That's why I want you to work. Even if you don't write your answers in the chat, even if you don't tweet me or write comments about it, do it for yourself because that's the way to learn. If I tell you always the correct answer without waiting for you to think about it, then you will not learn so much from it. I think this is a much better way to learn. First, we work, we make an effort, and then we see what is the solution. So here, d5, many of you have said it. Very good, very good. We can play d5 already because this pawn cannot be captured. After e takes, we would capture with the knight. Or it's it's almost always the knight because we want to open the diagonal, we want to exchange this defending piece on f6 and after c takes d5 this pawn is untouchable, it cannot be captured because of the discover the tech bishop takes h7 winning an exchange. So that's why d5 is a really good move. Black shouldn't really take e takes d5. If he cannot win the pawn, then he shouldn't capture this because that would just mean that he's opening up the position while he's still undeveloped. He would open the e file, that's where our rook can attack the queen. All the white pieces would be active, the knight is hanging, and black still did not finish development. So, this isn't really a good idea to capture on d5. Black should try to keep the position closed, but after d5, well, what can he do? He should move the knight. And here after rook fe1, all the white pieces are perfectly placed. You see that now we have one rook supporting the pawn, the other facing the queen, pinning the pawn on, on e6. Queen c5 was played in the game. And after knight e4, once again, we are trading this knight because it's a good defending piece. If you want to attack the opponent's king, you want to eliminate the defenders around the king, so we are not exchanging pieces to end up in an end game. What white is doing is exchanging the good pieces of black, the defending pieces around black's king. So now he has no defending pieces. After bishop takes e4, there are already th threatening. There are so many threats already. For instance, this discovered attack, the rook will be hanging on a8. That's why he had to play bishop b7. But now, how to attack black's king? I let you think a bit about this. We already have a queen on the long diagonal. We have the bishop on e4. How shall we continue our attack? Very good, knight g5. I see that uh, you are all commenting about it. Those also asking me who is my best pupil. I don't know. I don't know. I'm all very proud of you. You are all great pupils, doing a great job. And what I said, even if you didn't guess the moves, I'm proud of you for working. I'm proud of you for making an effort. So 
just for being here with us in this session, learning with us and making the effort of thinking about the positions so that later on you will understand much more about the position because you really did care about the position, you thought about it, you tried to figure out yourself, the solution, and then when you see the moves, you learn from it. That's the point. So I'm very proud of everyone, even if you didn't say the correct moves. If you said it, well done as well. You are all great pupils. Knight g5 was the best move, threatening to capture on h7. And now, after h6, the good move is bishop h7 check, because here, after king h8, Yusupov just went for the attack immediately with knight takes f7, giving up this bishop. The idea is not to capture the rook, because that's a rook for two pieces. He really wanted to mate his opponent with queen c2 check. And after g6, what would you play with y? This is not what happened in the game. g6 wasn't played. You can capture the, the rook with knight takes d8, but there's an even better move that I want you to find how to continue with the attack. We are a piece down for two pawns, but it's a piece down. And we want to continue attacking Black's King because it's a very lonely king. Very good, Nuna. Rook takes e6, threatening queen g6 mate, so rook g8 has to be played. And now after queen d2, once again we are threatening mate, queen takes h6. And in case of queen f8, there's a beautiful finishing move. What to play with white here? You've seen a similar idea, at least a similar sacrifice in another position. Rook e7, very good Tomcat. Rook e7 is an amazing move. Of course, the rook cannot be captured because of queen takes h6. And if it cannot be captured, then there are just hardly strong threats, all kinds of discover checks, and uh, well, basically knight g5, double check, double discover check, discover, double check. However, it is said, we are threatening with it, and also the knight cannot go away because of the bishop on b7, well, but that's just a minor thing. Basically, the king will be mated, so after rook e7, the position is completely lost for black. I want you to see how Yusupa finished the game, because after queen c2 check, his opponent played king g8. And here, once again, it's your turn to think. You can always capture the rook on d8, but I prefer that you give mate if you can. How? Let's see how. Knight h6, very good. After knight h6, with, we are sacrificing yet another piece because g takes h6, queen g6, the king is just with no shelter. King f8, queen takes h6 was played in the game. And after king g8, he gave a few more checks to place the queen in the best possible square. And now by bringing the rook, you can see that black's king is completely naked. There are no pawns, there are no defending pieces. And rook g5, queen h6 is going to be a mate. So this was a beautiful finish but the point is that it was possible because Yusupov broke through with d5 let's go back to the moment where he played d5 black was still undeveloped so when you can play d5 
and your opponent's pieces are still on the 8th rank, that's a very good thing. Of course, you, we should always try to find the right moment to play d5, and in, in order to play d5, you have to prepare d5. That's why, mostly, a rook comes to the d5, one of the rooks and the other rook goes to the 5, where your opponent's queen is, to pin the pawn, to attack the queen, whatever... You need the rooks on the D file and the C file, or on the D file and the E file. You need to make sure that when you play D5, it's not just for losing the pawn, but it's because you will either have a very strong attack if you give up the pawn, or this pawn is going to be a very strong pass pawn in an end game. So it's either for the sake of the attack, or for having this beautiful, very strong pass pawn that we saw in the Aronian game. I hope that you enjoyed this session. Uh, as a last exercise, I want you to think about something that is not about hanging pawns and not about middle game, is that tomorrow is the last day of the year. And I don't know about you, but I like New Year's resolutions a lot. And I read a very inspiring tweet by Kasparov in which he said that in order to make 2016 a better year, we need to analyze this year, the year of 2015, and see what we did well and what can we, what we did well and what, what we did not do so well, what can we improve for the next year. So, I don't know about you, but if you would like to do this with me, I will definitely do it. Think about your year in terms of chess and in general as well. What would you like to do differently next year? We will have a lot of sessions, a lot of middle game sessions in 2016, that I can promise. So think about your chess, what you want to improve in your chess, make a list about it and tell me about it next week because we will have a new session next Wednesday. It will be soon announced, the time, but next Wednesday I'm going to see you. And thank you so much for being here. I'm very proud of all of you, even if you didn't get the answers. I'm very proud for, for you working here, for studying here with me. And I really hope to see you next Wednesday as well. Bye-bye. And Happy New Year. Yeah.